And we're live, everyone. Hello, and welcome well, to the Entities Included Generic Book Club. That's what we call it. Yes. This, uh, this month, we've, we're starting a bit late, but we've read uh, Ben Yahtzee Croshaw's Mogworld, his first novel, published in the... 20th to 21st century. Yeah. Published in time. Published in time. Has anyone got a copy of the book? I feel like we should hold up the cover or something. No. No. So, Dan's going to briefly go over the plot so we don't run for four hours again. Mm-hmm. Um, from what I remember, I kind of listened to it in two big chunks, and I think that's kind of hampered how much I actually remember it. It's kind of all blent into one amorphous blob. But I'll, I'll try to go... Hmm? Be concise. Be concise. Okay. Uh, you're kind of slowing down there a bit, but I think I get the gist. Yeah, I still can see, but don't worry. Robot. Exactly. So, we have our main character. His name is Jim. And he's studying to be a wizard. Um, but his college gets attacked by barbarian mercenaries. He gets killed. And his life gets... Well, his life... His situation gets a lot better. He kind of goes... Hmm? He kind of goes to heaven. And everything is nice and everything is kind of wonderful. And then some bastard brings him back to life. Everything gets shit again. He spends most of his time. Well, he, he's resurrected by Lord Dreadgrave, who is a uh, master necromancer, and he's first class res- employer. Hmm? First class employer, yes. Yeah, first class he, employer. He wants to kind of ri- raise an army of the dead, um, who would all be kind of mindless minions and slaves unto him. But the problem is, all of the zombies that he raises have free will, so he kind of has to tempt them with promises of money and... Musical theatre. Musical theatre, yeah. That, that's, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, which he does. He's a very good employer and everyone loves working for him. He also kind of... He has odd other great uh, management qualities, like always remembering everyone's name and listening to people and always trying to implement like changes that you, you kind of put to him. Um, but his... Doom Castle and kind of the majority, all but three of the zombies, um, uh, who are our kind of other main characters, a female zombie called Meryl, and a, another male zombie called Thaddeus. We don't learn that till later. Uh, they manage to escape because his Doom Castle is deleted by these strange angel type creature things. Before that happens, isn't it worth mentioning that the castle keeps on getting attacked by adventurers at yeah. the point where after they're cleaning out like the spike pits, they notice that the same adventurers are, are turning up dying and then coming again. And then they capture one of them, don't they? And they interrogate him. And they're like, well, yeah, of course we kind of come back and keep attacking the castle again. It's our job. And it's Slippery John, isn't it? He's the person who gets interrogated in the dungeon. Who has, who is a shit adventurer and has a ridiculous moustache. Yes. And possibly a scout yeah. accent. And he kind of reveals that no one dies anymore. Whenever anyone does kind of die, their spirit just kind of gets sent back to the nearest church. They get resurrected. And then they can start attacking castles again. Uh, Another important thing is that Jim, our beloved hero, tries to kill himself. Many, many many times. As do a lot of the zombies. None of them can. They kind of keep going back to their own body. Um, Their spirit kind of leaves their zombie corpse and then is kind of forced back. Which is different with the adventurers who kind of get a new body every time, which is why the rat pit kind of fills up too fast. Um, So these uh, deleters, these angels, try to... Basically, they just delete the Doom Castle. But Meryl, Thaddeus, and Jim escape, 
And then we kind of have the main hijinks of the book, which is basically the entire middle part where they get captured, they escape, they get captured. So they get captured. Well, actually, I suppose we should introduce Barry. Um, Barry is kind of like one of the first people they meet out on the open road. He's the priest of the church. Um, and after they kind of... There are kind of several religious factions who want to kind of get this church because it's like a adventuring hot, adventuring resurrection hotspot. Yeah. Um, but once they kind of figure out that the Doom Castle has gone, no one kind of wants it, and Barry gets a bit pissed off with everyone and starts his kind of revenge um, plot against the zombies, against Jim and, Jim and Co. To, he's got nothing to live for anymore, apart from his fierce devotion to the Pope. Uh, <laughs> Feel free to jump in at any time. Yeah, I'm... yeah, well, no, it seems to be good so far. Well, he's a um, Seventh-day Hedge Adventist, isn't he? Um, no, I don't think he is. Uh, that's what Thaddeus... No, he's the... no, he's the same religion as Thaddeus. Hmm? No, it's slightly different. Oh, yeah, because th there's a bit more to it. It's um, de third devolutionary something chapter. Possibly, yes. It's It's basically... It's essentially the same religion, but it's very, it's very slightly different. Um, yeah, basically, on the different sort of... Yeah, it's basically hidden. just like the reformed Seventh-day Adventist of the oobly -boo. Exactly. Exactly. I just like the fact that Hedge is involved. Yeah. So anyway, they're both priests of different aspects of the same religion, and... They yeah. hate each other. Thaddeus kind of hates everyone. He He's, he's got a very much holier-than-thou... He hates Jim, seeing him as an abomination of nature and God, even though he himself is also an abomination of nature and God. Yeah. Yeah. Thaddeus would be a great character to play in D&D. &D. He would mm. very much be. I could imagine you playing him, here, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, and everyone would hate him. Yeah. <laughs> but he so, can't die. Yes. They go to the... They, they find their way to the church. Um, they meet up with Slippery John again. And Slippery John kind of tells him about the magic resistance and he tells him about um, well they're kind of they're on this epic quest to die and Slippery John tells him of the magic resistance also known as the Suicide Squad who are trying to figure out ways to die because something's happened in the world it's not just the adventurers who are kind of dying and coming back to life it's everyone no one can die no one's being born everyone's immortal and is it at this point it's worth mentioning the people who have the syndrome? Yes. Yes, because this is where Slippery John's girlfriend, I think, is brought into it. And yeah. future wife. Future wife. Spoilers. <laughs> so, syndrome victims... There are different stages to the syndrome. To start off with, it just kind of... They start talking funny. Um... In weird, unusual... It's sort of like, you know, very even kilter and very, very direct context. Like, can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about this? I wish to know information about this. And then just walk off and breaking sentences and then repeat themselves and things, don't they? And then also kind of talking right. like gibberish things like verb and gug and things like that. Yeah. And they also sort of start moving in a very regular fashion. Yes. And sometimes they just stand around for ages on it. Mm. And... And, and then suddenly start suddenly start walking. It's at this yeah. point where I think if you weren't sure already or didn't or didn't already know what the plot of the book book was, you might begin to understand what's going on in the world as well. Yeah. Um, and oh, what was her name? Sort of John's girlfriend. She doesn't actually talk ever in the book. Um, uh, basically, Jim fucks with her and she ends up catatonic. Yeah, he fucks with this. Whenever he, whenever, whenever Jim dies, he goes into this weird sort of like blank space where ever, does everyone just have the sort of like lines around them or something like that? It's basically. Uh, he goes into a sort of spirit that. world. Was well, that at some point he does that? Yeah, well, it seems to be a spirit world, and you see, you can see the deletes, you can see the angels, and you can see the angels controlling some of the people. Is that right, or something like the angels? He sees an yeah, angel but... in. Um, I want to say, Deirdre, but that's not it. It begins with a D. It's got a D for now. Um, 
and he kind of touches the the angel as Alita, and then she just kind of spazzes out and just kind of goes limp. Yeah, and basic, and then at this point, there's a sort of minor split between the party, but we don't really need to go into that. Um, no, all we need to know is that Jim is just on his own. He's going to try and find passage to the city where uh, the magical resistance is. But he's then going to die basically. At this, at this point, he's clear that he wants to die, right? Yeah. Yes. But he kind of gets to the city, and really weird stuff is happening. Well, he yeah, gets to the fort town, support. and weird stuff is happening. Yeah. Um, so there are people who are basically just kind of repeating the same action. Um, so I think there's like someone who's gardening, but the shovel kind of never goes into the dirt. Um, there's someone clipping a bush, and they're like three feet from the bush. Uh, people kind of like lying down on their face, walking, moving their legs as if to walk, but not doing anything. Cause they're how long this, do they say this has been going on for? Is it about 50 years? Because Jim's been dead about 80, or what's the difference? Uh, well, that's how long the um, resurrection's been going on. Resurrection's been 50 years, but he's been dead about 80, hasn't he? So. Hmm. Uh, the infusion happened 15 years ago, and he died like 60, 65 years ago. Um, the weird stuff that was happening in this town was just a couple of days. Yeah. Ah. But, um, basically, weird stuff's happening in this town, and while investigating, Barry shows up with his cult and is infused with the new powers. Yes. He also kind of uses very, very powerful magic that is kind of explained that even the highest uh, priests can use without being exhausted, and he just uses it kind of two, three times. Um, and they also have to get, like, sanctions to do it by the church, and he just kind of fires off a ton. Um, which is strange, because he was a bit of a wet blanket last time we saw him, and he died very easily. Yep. Um, and he's destroying the town. Well, he's been enlisted by his god to destroy the town. Do you learn the god's name at this point as well? Uh, it's a bit later, but... Later yeah. on, yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, Jim awesome. escapes the town mm. on a pirate ship. Oh, yeah. Jim escapes the town on a pirate ship at this point. Yes. He basically realises that, you know, as a zombie, he doesn't need to breathe, so he's just going to kind of walk into the ocean. Um, but then he's kind of picked up by pirates who are kind of grab a chest that he fell asleep on or something. And Slippery John is with them. Again. Yeah. Because Jim just can't shake idiots. Uh, it really does remind me of the 8-bit theatre comic where basically the writer of that, Brian Clevenger, just said, you know, a lot, the kind of main source where he gets his comedy from is that everything that happens in the world happens to hurt Black Mage. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, I think it's the same here. It's like, Gyatse's done everything that happens in the world happens to hurt Jim. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so we meet Slippery John, they try to... There's a barrier which is stopping anything alive from entering uh, the town and exiting. So the pirates got here at an unfortunate time which kind of forced them to... They're, they're trapped, essentially, until kind of everything's put right by Barry. Um and the only way to kind of get out is to basically kill Barry. That's like the only way they can kind of get rid of the barrier is to kind of kill the caster. So they do, but then he regenerates very quickly in his own body, which is not something which you can do in the world. So that's unusual. Um, so then they kill him again. <laughs> they get half of the ship out, but then he regenerates and the ship is kind of cut in two. Yeah. I can't remember how they kind of survive with just half a ship. They don't. They um, Jim washes overboard, and we're never told how the others get to land. We might have been told maybe we just kind of skipped over, but yeah, Jim just kind of sinks, 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 goes through the bottom layer, appears in the sky, and then falls. Yeah. And and this is when he gets the revelation of gods talking to one another in gibberish. I was wondering when that was. That was it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's quite clear to the reader that it's text chat conversation between two people who are game developers. I think it's more obvious in the book um, because it's kind of formatted like a... Uh, it's, it's not more obvious. It, it's still very obvious, but it's kind of formatted in like emails and stuff in the, um, in the actual novel. Yeah, I thought that would have been quite interestingly written uh, initially in those scenes, by the way, it was, they were speaking. They also spoke quite sort of yeah, like text speak basically, which is nice. Mm. So yeah, there's um dub, dub, Simon, and and they're discussing this kind of rogue game developer, aren't they? It's a new person they've got on the team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Simon the prick. He's often yeah. known as who's one whose name we can't remember. Appears in Yahtzee's next novel. I was going to say actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I haven't read Jam yet, but yeah, they're they're linked. Hmm. Linkless Studios, his big multiverse thing. <laughs> um, um, basically, I think like the more the more important one. He's like the guy who's in charge. The guy whose name we can't remember, yeah. but he kind of he Is leaves he because he takes a stress holiday. Yeah, because of the dickhead. Because of the dickhead. Um. So now they're on a new continent. They're uh, on the Heroes Trail. They're on the Heroes Trail. So this is this like where they're in like the big city? Is this where he starts giving out the Yeah. He gives out the uh, they need to kinda of, like stock up by stuff, so he's um he has to find money and he kinda of gives someone a quest. Give him fifty gold pieces. Um Yeah, and then but yeah, basically, it's the syndrome people. The syndrome people are running around looking for quests, and then not just the syndrome people. Regular adventurers, adventurers as well. Yeah, it's true, actually. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So everyone's sort of looking for this. All they, what, what, what does he have to give them? Do you just do you need to like um? Give he them just needs to, to sign, sign, them, give them, sign them, up to them. Yeah. Sign their quest log and give them points, and he kind of like gets to fifty gold and just tries to find like an average number, gives them a hundred points, and then everyone tries to give him fifty gold. Everyone tries to fulfill the quest. Mm. Um, and he ends up giving away like thousands of points, which gets him arrested because it's a kind of fraud. Yeah. Really by the by the king. I think I've missed a kidnapping. Oh uh, yeah, no, this is um, when he's kidnapped by Mr. Wonderful. Oh yes, is it worth mentioning Mr. Wonderful now actually? Okay, so he's kidnapped by Mr... No, because he's kidnapped by Mr. Wonderful and then he's taken to the king. Yeah, that's what happens. Okay. Uh, it's Mr. Wonderful and... What's the dwarf's name? Can't remember. Monotone dwarf. Not as interesting as Mr. Wonderful. No. Very interesting. Character. Began with a B, I think. It's like Bulb... So will call him Dwarf. I think <laughs> yes, his ancestral name, Dwarf. Um, and Mr. Wonderful kind of laments that he can't really torture people anymore um, because they just kind of die and then come back. There's not really any po He's a sociopath, but there's no point to being a sociopath because you can't... He, he, I think he kills himself a couple of times. Yeah, he realises the best way to intimidate other people is doing things along the lines of cutting his own hand off until he leads to death, dying, mm -hmm. coming back in the room, and then eating himself. Yeah. That was a bit weird. Yeah, I just love his entrance in that bit. Um, it's a little further on from where we are, but just the fact you just hear him running and bursting in this flappy white gown, um, mm. dressing robe. <laughs> um, so the group are taken to the king, who wants to be merciful, but the adventurers' guild insists they're locked away, mm. which makes Jim very happy. I wouldn't say very happy. It, he's when he is actually locked away and he realizes that he's in a nice, uh, safe cell, he kind of thinks, you know, I could get used to this. And then Meryl is in the next cell over. Yeah, that doesn't last long. Meryl, oh. Meryl and him have a bit of a connection, as in Meryl is convinced that he's from a certain ancestry. Is that right? He's from a certain mm -hmm. part of the world. Beauregardian. Pure-blooded Beauregardians uh, left. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so she's a bit of um, uh, a nerd when it comes to that kind of genealogy mm. heritage thing, and so she kind of... Well, she's a, a Binny, a Borogardian supremacist. Yeah, exactly, yeah, but she's incredibly sort of sweet and sort of naive. Yeah. She hates but, um, and during the sequence, basically, everyone wants them to escape but Jim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the king slips um, the key. In the scum. Slippery John gives him a key in... Croissant, I think. Yeah. And then a... And Mr. Wonderful comes and just says, like, we're going to bust you out. Well, no, they, uh, yeah, Mr. Wonderful places a guard in front of his cell who's going to let them escape. Yeah. Yeah, who, who falls asleep with um, keys on a hook, even though, on his belt, even though you don't get belts with hooks on. Yeah, it must have been specially made. So no, no, doesn't he describe it as a um, coat hanger duct taped to his belt? Yeah, something along those lines, yeah. <laughs> and um, they escape, and then and then they go to find the magic resistance, as I recall. Uh, yes, they have to meet up with Slippery John, um, who Jim turns into a rabbit because he buys a polymorph spell, and then he, Slippery John, just kind of stays as a rabbit for a, a while. Which, which is a bit of an interesting point, but I'm not sure if it went anywhere, but we'll come to the later, because he turns them into a rabbit, doesn't he? It's like meant to be a really low-level spell. Mm -hmm. um, and then they point out the fact that you're immortal when you're a rabbit. Mm. So you but it's only meant to last for a second. Rabbit, then just put some boots them and then just kill them, basically. But he stays for a very long time for some unknown reason. I can't remember if they explain why. They kind because of... he doesn't want to. Yeah, he wants to stay as a rabbit, because he wants to stay as a rabbit so much. Because he's between Meryl's breasts. Yeah, that was it, yeah. That's what it says at the time, but I think he kind of dismisses that later. Well, yeah, she's a zombie. Yeah, I found out some zombie breasts that are... Uh... Yeah, but she's only been... Well, I don't know much about decomposition, but she's like the youngest zombie there. She's also technically the oldest, because she was the first one raised. But she was recently dead, comparatively, or something. Mm. Anyway, yeah. of, um, necrophilia um, fringe. Yeah, necrophilic rabbits aside, yeah. they find the magic resistance after a very long, pointless well, bit. Well, kind of um, avoid capture from the guards who are chasing after Slippery John, or the adventurers, um, and then they, they go... captured from... again by... Oh, no, Thaddeus gets captured by the mole people. They, they go home again captured by the mole people. Thaddeus stays with them to preach his religion. Um, but then they kind of get captured by the magic resistance, but then things get are okay because... That's who they want. Uh, yeah. That's who they wanted to find, and magic resistance wanted to find them as well. Um, and then kind of Barry comes, and he's kind of converting the entire world to his religion. Um, Simon. Of yeah. Lord Simon. Simon. Um, because Simon, at this point, the the game dev is basically fucking up all of the shit in Mogworld, um, and he's basically like saying, he's like, yeah, why don't we just, just have one world religion? Why don't we have everyone kind of united under this one um, person, who is me? Yeah, and none of the other programmers really agree with this, obviously, but he's kind of, has he kind of hacked his way in by this point, and he's changing the rules? By this point, like, the, me the head guy has gone on his holiday, um, where he's been told he's not allowed in any set stressful situations, so don't let Simon do anything. Yeah. And then Simon kind of locks out everyone else and... <laughs> yeah. Or he locks out Dub. And he also later on tries to steal um, money from the company and shit like that. Yeah. Uh, he, he kind of says that's going to be his plan, but he, he doesn't get around to it. But, um... And I honestly don't remember what ha how they got out of the situation basically they've all been ca they're surrounded by si um, Barry's army mm -hmm. um, well first off the head of the magic resistian resistance um, who was a good character by the way he's a good character he's an immortal vampire now he, now he's pissy that everyone else is immortal as well well, and also he got fired from his job as evil overlord and now is retired and wears he, cardigans. Yeah, he, he was put into a forced retirement. Yeah. Uh, Barry 
basically kills him. And then... How did they escape? Yeah, I can't remember how they escaped. I think they just ran away. Yeah, I can't remember now either. I think I was getting um, kidnapped fatigue at that point. Mm. Yeah, because it looked they w they weren't gonna have like any chance to escape, but then the mole people attacked, and then like the magic resistance had a chance. Um, then and then the Barry king was... attacks Barry with his sword. Well, there's a really stupid bit about the king pretending to be a dentist. Yeah, because the king couldn't be seen as like the leader of the magic resistance. So it was like, I'm not the king. I'm the king's dentist. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It was a bit uh, over long. The joke did go on a while. Um, um, and then uh, the Adventurers Guild sides with Barry and joins him. And then what? We're getting near the end now, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know what happens to connect this point to Jim con um, contacting Dub and Dub Transporting it's him. Actually, it's something I remember. It's something to do with um, Slippery John's girlfriend. She suddenly starts talking, and she's being controlled by Dub. Do you that remember? was it. Yes, that was it. And, um, and Dub realizes that the program characters, whatever. Well, well, Jim starts talking to Dub because, well, um, at some point, I think it was like when he fell through the sky. Jim's eyes kind of uh, go squish, so yeah. replaced with. Octopus or giant squid eyes because they're very close to humans. Yeah. So they kind of like take this uh, idea and they put Slippery John's girlfriend's, who is syndrome victim, her eyes into Jim. That's it, yeah. And he starts kind of seeing text and he starts seeing like names of people above their heads. Um, and he talks to Dub then and. Talks to Dub. Yeah. And then that's kind of like where Lord Simon uh, locks out Dub, and the only way that Dub can get into contact with Jim and everyone is to talk through Slippery John's girlfriend. And Slippery, and um, one of the last things Dub does is sort of like soup up Slippery John's girlfriend's character's stats. So she's mm -hmm. now an amazing magic user, and I think she like uses a teleport spell or something on them. Yes. Yeah, she uses she teleports them to. Now, what's their goal at this point? They want to get somewhere, don't they? They need yeah. to get to the Nexus. They need to get to the... Well, basically, Dub wants to reboot the server, essentially. Mm -hmm. But he can't do it because he's been locked out. So he gets Jim, who is basically a bug in the code, yeah. um, to go to the server, touch it, which will... Force reboot. Blue screen, yeah. Um, um, and the Nexus is located on the top of Mount Murdercruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the world that goes above the clouds. Which I'm pretty sure is a Simpsons reference. Uh, it's Murderhorn, isn't it? I think in the Simpsons. Yeah. The Murderhorn, which is next to two other giant mountains. Of the... <laughs> oh. It has a giant mountain on top of it. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. So. So. Friend, uh, it scrolls the. Uh, Syndrome woman to create a portal to send them to the top of the mountain, but something goes wrong. Yeah, so, um, she was killed by Barry. Stabbed by. She gets stabbed by Mr. Wonderful. Oh, okay. So they only end up about halfway up the mountain and have to walk the rest of the way. And luckily, Slippery John's got these gravity crampons, which were a bit of a coincidence. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it, that was kind weird. of a big room. That was meant to be the big reveal about his character that he's actually a good adventurer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah. We'll get back to opinions later on, but I don't think that really worked for me. But uh... no. and basically, Jim and Thaddeus work together to climb up the mountain, and mm. they yeah. defeat um, Mr. Wonderful, and Jim Force crashes the server. Yeah, but before that, there's a bit of a there's a bit with Thaddeus, isn't there? Isn't Thaddeus and um, uh, yeah. Thingy have a, like a magical battle. Yeah, yeah this is the only time Thaddeus revealed that Barry wrote his thesis on Thaddeus. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was a nice moment because it, it was a nice, it was a nice little moment. But uh, and at this point, Thaddeus is casting spells with his toes. 
Yes, because he's got no arms. Because he's a worshipper of Simon, he's hacked the system. Um, doesn't Barry kill Thaddeus? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. Yeah, and how does Jim defeat Barry then? He doesn't. Uh, he manages to he touch the computer first. Right. He touches the computer, which kind of reboots the system, and then he kind of goes to this plane where it's just kind of there's nothing. It's just kind of like the bedrock well, layer. Yeah, it's at this point that Barry kills him, and he falls off, and well, then it goes to the plane. He kills himself so that he can touch the server to infect it with mm. his buggy yeah. code. Um, but then... Then we're at the base layer of... Around. Hmm? He is still like walking around, isn't he? Like when it goes to the broken server. He goes back to his body. Mm. Um, and then there's kind of like a final showdown with Barry, and it's, it does kind of like say that this is where it's like revealed that Simon's going to kind of take Barry away and use him to find all of the um, files which have anything to do with um, money and security. Yeah, payroll. Payroll, that's what it was. Um, and then uh, Jim manages to stop this and talks to Dub. He kind of dies, and then in his buggy kind of state, he rips out all of the deleters, all of the angels that were kind of plugged into Barry, which was giving him his super powers, and basically his buggy code just kills Barry. Yeah. And then he does kind of, he talks to, talks to Dub again, and they kind of like explain that we had no idea that you were actually intelligent. And he kind of like uses this analogy of, well, we kind of created, like, imagine like a toy maker making a toy. Um, it's just like a wooden toy. He wants it to be more realistic. So he kind of puts um, leather muscles on, gives it clothes, makes it kind of talk. Um, makes it act the way that people would act, and eventually it seems like a real person, but you know that it's not. Uh, I think he does it a bit better than that. I can't remember what he says exactly. If yeah. it's like a review. But Dub's original plan was to basically reboot the system, make it back to how it was, but then people would still have the syndrome and all that sort of thing, and then people would still be, live forever, and doesn't Jim convince him not to do this? Hmm. Yeah. So, it's like a normal world. Do they say what's going to happen to the world? People, it's still going to be used for, isn't it? People are still going to play in it. Yeah, yes. uh, that's what the whole epilogue is. Um, basically, they made angels the player characters. Ah, right. And there's sort of a snarky review at the end that's meant to be like Yahtzee's reviewer personality reviewing the game. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That was fun, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and also the bit I think was worth mentioning that we mentioned just before we did this is what actually happens to Jim at the end as well. Mm. Because to reward Jim, he wants to give him like a, a better life in the world. So, you, well, you said that he gave him like a big sort of like muscular hero warrior body, but he was like, no, that doesn't feel right. Yeah, like classic then, Conan. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he then he's, then it's, to a next Jim kind of says that it doesn't feel right. It's not like Dub saying this is a bit weird. This isn't what Jim would want. Jim's kind of yeah, ancestral yeah. memory kind of kicks in and is like, this just doesn't feel weird. Something is wrong. I shouldn't have this nose. Yeah. Yeah, so he gives him a few other bodies, like a powerful necromancer and other other positions in life and that sort of thing. But what, it, what he ends up coming down to that he enjoys is sending him right back to the very first day that it all started when before his college got attacked and Jim decides to bugger off instead of dying. Yeah, yeah. and in each of them... Uh, Mabel's with him. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a bit odd that um, because I always got the impression that Mog World or the world in general existed before they started coding, or was that only their perception? So the characters in the game. I know they. Uh, no, they um, many philosophical debates in the game, which aren't, I don't think, are resolved. I think it's implied that they wrote the entire history. Yeah. And, the, and they sort of. No, I think they wrote the history, but they kind of also, essentially. They built oh, no, because it's all procedural generals. In code, and that was like the pre-alpha kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it, it's all procedurally generated, so they just set up parameters and tweaked it to get the most optimal mm. natural outcome. Yeah, so is that... Um, 
Is that it? Then is that the entire thing? That's the plot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's first start with um, what did we each think of the book? Well, so we'll start with Dan because he's talked the most. Um, I remember I read this. I think I was probably in college, um, so like seventeen, eighteen, and I I really enjoyed reading it the first time, um, but the second time round. It really didn't draw me in as much. Um, I didn't particularly find it all that enjoyable. I found the comedy was... It was quite silly, um, and not in like the fun way. It was just... It It was humorous, but it wasn't... Laugh out loud funny. Laugh out loud funny. Um, you can kind of like point out... If you see a joke, then you can like point it out and say, "Ah, oh, yeah, that was a joke there. That was a joke there." Rather than laughing. Yeah. Um, so it was like, "Oh, I see what you did there." Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, it does kind of feel a bit repetitive, and yeah, essentially just like the way that the comedy comes across. It's just like, "Oh yeah, Jim is just kind of snarky, and he's angry, and..." He hates everything, and he was the sort of the interject, wasn't it? He? he was the the Yahtzee's point of view, the attitude, yeah. that misanthrope character. He was um, which... very much authorial insert. Yeah, very much so, which I think is totally fine in a story like this. Mm-hmm. But I guess maybe I've just kind of seen that stuff too much now. Well, this is what I was going to say. Did anyone notice? I mean, you can't really help it when you've got fantasy and comedy and sort of meta stuff in a story, but did anyone else get the, this Terry Pratchett vibe from it? Yeah. Yeah, mm. and you, can't, you can't really help it when you're dealing with that sort of thing. It's probably true of a lot of other comedy fantasy writers as well. They, they always get that labelled, but there were definitely certain elements which felt very much like that. I felt like um, the school bit at the beginning and Mr. Wonderful were particularly Pratchett-esque. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Or like little details like the fact that the Dark Lord's wearing a cardigan and has like a dowdy wife. Yeah, exactly. That was the bit that totally reminded me of it as well, actually, yeah. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that's in Pratchett at some point. Yeah, yeah, that's very much a case of Pratchett did it, so... <laughs> Even Pratchett did it. The computer game thing, do you remember the Yetis in, in one of the books? There's not that kind of like a computer game reference with the um, Thief of Time. The yet is that if they die, they come back to a previous point where they saved. They can come back like I haven't read the for time yet. It's very good. <laughs> um, and the story, I guess, because I kind of knew <coughs> what was coming, I knew how it was going to end. Like there wasn't that kind of journey of discovery and that kind of questioning, like what is actually happening. <laughs> That's like the reveal and. Kind of figuring out that it is like part of a computer game, I think, was like an important part of reading it for the first time. Which, without that, kind of going in with that foreknowledge, I think, does take away from the book as well. Yeah, I was going to say. So when you first read this, you had no idea that it was in in a computer game, in a memorial game. No, I had no idea. Well, um, that must have been quite a nice good. I, I kind of already knew, and I, I'll definitely say that kind of sullied my enjoyment of it. Hmm. But it shouldn't have done because I, I felt that was a bit of a selling point of it. Um, so, I didn't really hear any of the um, reviews or... Uh, what's it called? I want to say propaganda, but that's not the right word. Publicity? Advertising. Publicity. That's the publicity. I didn't kind of oh. hear any of the publicity. Well, I just got it from the, from the Zero Punctuation. I think he mentions his book several times. I'm fairly sure he says it's a fancy novel set inside of a Morpica. Uh, I'm very sure that, that that was part of the main advertising. So you're probably quite lucky. That's like an extra bonus. But I don't think he was. I don't think he was writing it from a point of view that he didn't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, I think I remember him, like hearing it was set in like the world of a warp again, but I just thought it meant like that kind of setting rather than. Oh yeah, it's in a morph again, and we're actually going to go to the real world and have all this interaction. And he could have had a few references. Yeah, and he could have had a few references in there to morph again type stuff. So I think. As, as, another way to rate to this, because I've not actually played many Memorpagas, but I got the gist of them mainly from his reviews and things. But how accurate, or how how many good references there were there to Memorpagas? Did they seem to capture the quirks? I'd say yeah. Um, I it's been a long time since I played a Memorpaga, but I would definitely say that that he captures the feel of a Memorpaga. Yeah. And. Definitely a lot of the fantasy tropes of Mumopicas. 
Yeah, definitely a lot of the fantasy tropes. Like, um, I think the beginning is actually the best bit of the book, but um, the bit where he's sort of describing how the necromancy is done, and it's sort of just weird big crystals that no one's quite sure how they affect things, but they look cool. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. I mean, there's a few things that I'm aware of about more more because things that annoy me that which I kind of I thought would have been nice to bring in, like um, things like I don't know, like fetch quests. I'm not, I'm not sure that, that that's more of an adventure game sort of thing, but it, you seem to get no worse. But, but yes, yeah, computer game. Getting a lot of fetch quests. I was sort of expecting there to be a lot more. Yes, I will do this for you. But first, you must get me the so and so from so and so for no reason. They won't speak to him. Like that kind of stuff might have been good. Or there, there was a little oh, well, like in the background. Here and kill twenty of those things. Now you must go there and kill thirty of those things. Now you must go there and kill forty of those things. You know that those are the things that annoy me and have odd little quirks, which I was mm. kind of expecting to pop up, but didn't really. Those were only really described in the background. Like uh, there's a scene where there's the nightly or weekly um, null raid. Yeah. And they sort of collect X number of null giblets to get money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. But it, I think it would be quite nice to have if you were, if he was focusing on that. Do you think that he was focusing on this to be a character story or just a parody sort of story? Do you reckon it was a Do you reckon it was a good story without the Morphica stuff, or do you reckon that's the only reason this works even a bit? I think it would have actually been a better story without the Morphica stuff. Interesting. Because well, I think that's where it falls down. How would you kind of run the whole immortality? I think resurrection. you'd have to sort of change the moral of it, obviously, in the end, sort of which the whole concept of AI. But if you stripped all of that out and say you just you're in a situation where it's a post-death society, which I think is actually a fascinating concept. Yeah. Um, yeah that's kind of hard to simplify if you want to go post-death. That's that's not really going to work in a. Well, no, you can death. do it through magical means, or like someone has killed the god of death, so thus no one can die. Hmm. Do you think there was a degree of pressure on Yotsu to write something that was computer game based because of his reputation at all? I think so, and that's why his second book is so much better. Yeah, yeah, well we might get to that in a bit, but I, I, I agree the second book's a lot yeah. better because he breaks it. This feels like a book that he was almost expected to write at a certain point, which I think mm. is fine. But well, you have to remember, Yotsu was also a game dev before he was a game reviewer. Yeah, yeah, no, I gathered that. Um, but let's go on to your opinion, Laurie. Um, I very much like Dan. I kind of didn't love it. I mean, I appreciated it and I liked it. That I liked some of the ideas and the concepts, but it felt like it would have been a better short story because, as we've said several times, there's multiple repeated like kind of scenes and things. It it didn't have a nice clear narrative, but because of that, I felt um, I didn't laugh out loud. There's like a few bits that I'm like, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's interesting, and that's nice idea, as like you were saying, but I didn't really find anything that was just sort of like that's hysterical, like, again, not to compare it to Terry Pratchett, but to compare it to Terry Pratchett, you get, like, it's good, um, like, it's Terry Pratchett's voice, it's his, it, and it's his, his, his words and his phrases and, his, and, and approach to the situations. This is focusing more on the Terry Pratchett-esque situations, whereas the, it was more Yahtzee speaking, but not necessarily in the way that we're familiar with, because of what he was mm. That could be also very much a thing to do with sort of British humour, because compare Douglas Adams to Terry Pratchett, and they've got a very similar voice and style. Yeah, very true. Yeah, but Yarts is also British, so it's got that kind of vibe. That British snark. And yeah. when, even when I tried to write comedy, I found it comes out in the same vein. Yeah. But it, yeah, but there was, there was kind of a clash. I think it would be better if it was just funny, opposed to just... Ha- or, or. The story didn't make sense, basically, is one of the things mm. I was trying to think, get to as well. Like... I mean, the, the 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 science of the world, as it were, like the, like the debate. Like I was saying, I wasn't quite sure if they were meant to be like a real world that was accessed, or they just thought they were a real world. And yeah. then there was some computer gamey things, but then there were some things which weren't. Like, why were some of the why were the characters so human who didn't have the syndrome? It, it, it was their AI that good? Is that what they were saying? That were I think it's so, that, yeah. People and things, yeah. And mm. then, okay. No yeah, no, no. Well, that that was it, really. I don't know. I just felt, I felt like it was a bit of a, a mess. I suppose. I mean, I think what my main comment with this novel, I think we'll all agree on. Once again, this is my second reading, Dan's second reading, but your first well, reading, reading well, actually. No, it's my second reading. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, this book is very much a first novel. That's a good point. Mm. And maybe it's just because I sort of follow a lot of Yahtzee's stuff. I can see 
everywhere where he's taking his inspiration and his voice from. Yeah. So his favourite novel is The Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I can totally tell now. You can totally see it in this. It's that same kind of roller, sco- roller coaster of escapes and peril and that kind of thing. Yeah. But, but the Count of Monte Cristo, you got a character whose personality sort of like changes and develops. But whereas the, uh, that was one of the problems with the Jim character, yeah. didn't really go in no arc. the misanthrope. Yeah, he didn't have an arc really. He was the same from the beginning to pretty much the end. I mean, the bits of the story that I liked in the first reading, I still really like. Mm. I think the first section in the castle where they're minions. Yeah. I feel like that was a really solid bit of writing and quite funny. I agree. Once that again, like that, that was like almost a short story in itself, but that was the initial idea. Mm. And I kind of wish it had just stayed there. That would or, be good, actually. Or if they'd actually gone with what was um, Merrill's idea of um, finding another evil overlord to serve under. Yeah, they could have changed some different evil overlords later on. That would be interesting. That or could have been quite fun. Fun. The evil overlord should be like attacking places or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Though actually there was a bit at the very end of that sequence, which I thought was the high point, where yeah. um, Barry has captured them and has sort of taken them into this village to be burned, and actually the villagers all like them. Yeah, that was good. That was actually very funny. Yeah, I, I thought that was one of the funniest bits in the book, mm. and the beginning is really solid. The first, the opening with the school is good. The bit where they're resurrected goes on far too long for my, for my mind. Mm. But then the bit where their minions is really fun, and then it just loses itself. It goes into a complete muddle. So again, it's a bit like the like um, cup of magic and like fantastic. You've got the character who's the character who's running around different situations, encountering different aspects. Which I think, if you're going to explore a concept like the Mamorphaga, having a character travel around and experience things is fine. But you, there wasn't enough variety. No. Yeah, and also towns and interacting with people and then going somewhere and then getting kidnapped and then going back to a town and then and it also never really felt fantastical no sort of, I mean I know that's something a lot of fantasy games lack in my opinion yeah. but as a lore nerd for worlds there's only one moment where I went that's a cool bit of lore and that's the difference between the two continents type of null Oh, right, yeah, that was quite funny, yeah, but again... But again. the gnolls just seem like big, hairy idiots, and the elves and the dwarves are identical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, you're writing, your voice for everyone is the same, Yahtzee. You know, show me some variety here. And, um... Yeah, I just felt... Actually, trying to... Maybe he was trying to make it a bit of a picaresque, if you know what I mean there. Picaresque. It's a type of novel where it's sort of a series of loosely connected um, incidents that's each meant to be sort of humorous in its own way. Yeah, oh, no, pre- yeah, yeah. Th- I think that would be fine, but it's like that explains stuff like why there's that bit with the pirates for no particular reason. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fine, but then there was kind of a continuing story. I don't know. There was, there was the whole plot with the magic resistance and the whole mm-hmm. deleters and that sort of thing. But none of it went anywhere. Yeah, so basically, things. If you can have like a, a picaresque story and you have lots of little stories like that that aren't really connected, you need like the main character to sort of develop and learn from these stories, and that way, that that way, the journey is an emotional journey. It's a character arc journey, and opposed to the world journey, because you know. But. But Jim uh, never changes. You always feel like he wants to die. Yeah. Which yeah. Which. Might be a reflection on the artsy at the time of his writing. Or. <laughs> <That's like> deep. <laughs> No, it's something he's open about. He's suffered from really? depression and that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's also just none of the characters change. There's a lot of stuff in there that's pointless. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff he complains that I'm complaining about, he complains about in video games, and that's probably the worst thing you can do. Yeah. No, I know, I know what you mean. Well, I, I was literally imagining before I read the bit at the end where, how he would see his own narrative. Mm. And how he would review it if that was all put into a, um, you know, into a game or something like that, and he was to experience it and see what he'd think. Well, that uh, whole sequence at the end when they're climbing the mountain feels like a video game sequence. Yeah, I, um, I get that. Cause in fairness, he's trying to he's trying to parry video games, so but I don't think mm. 
clear enough, really, a lot of the time. Whether whether that was a joke on the world or a joke on the uh, on the video games in general. Maybe that was sort of the problem with it that he never chose what he was parodying. Yeah. Whereas uh, that's the problem with parody in general because you, it's difficult to have a story and a parody at the same time because you're sort of like going one way, oh this is stupid, then you're going, but we do actually need to do this sort of thing. <laughs> you can you can do that. I mean, look at the Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, yeah. and it can be done well, but I just think it's not easy. And this yeah, that, that's true. People think it's easy to write a parody, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. And that's the thing. You're taking a Mamorpaga. You're taking essentially three genres on top of themselves. God, yeah. Because you've got the Morphaga, you've got the fantasy, and then you've got whatever literary genre is in. You know, the I can't remember what um, Count of Monte Cristo's class does. Adventure, I don't know. Yeah. But that kind of you know sort of yeah. roller coaster style. I can't remember what it's called. And he doesn't ever choose one. Yeah. Now we've mentioned it once or twice, but I think it might be worth referencing because you said this book's very much like a first novel. Mm. Um, in the way that it also feels like he's exper- experiencing random little ideas, like, oh, wouldn't this be good? Like, like he's got lots of back burner ideas that he's just been throwing onto here. Well, let's try that thing I thought of five years ago. Let's think of that thing, and he's kind of like getting it out of the system and seeing what works and stuff. Whereas, compare it to Jam, his next book, it's a lot neater, it's a lot smarter and well thought out. I mean, there's bits in Jam that are badly done as well, but. Oh, yeah, not perfect. But, it, it, yeah. And I think that's. Just discovering who you are as a writer. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's worth noting that he's not a terrible writer. He's, he, it, it is good. I, I think it's not awful. This book. It is. That's almost the problem with it. Yeah, I think if I think if it was yeah if it was terrible, it wouldn't be as annoying. <laughs> yeah, because it's got potential. Because there's bits in it that I can really like. Yeah. Like the bits with um, Lord Redgrave talking to Jim and Mabel, or yeah. Meryl. And about like how to make the rat pit more efficient. Yeah, there was funny but little bits like that which looked like that. But that again that feels like a good idea that he had at some point, but then uh yeah, he had to use all his other ideas that he had as well at some point too. Hmm. But yeah, so I think like I mean it's what about as not as comedy as like just uh, in in its quality of writing, his style of writing, was there anything you noticed about that? Um as a fantasy world, it well, it worked well as a generic fantasy world, I think. Yeah. Despite its lack of fantasticalness, yeah. which I, I still think is an element you need in fantasy. Something that I found a bit annoying that I didn't kind of get. I, it was supposed to be like a joke. It was supposed to be funny, but I can't remember if it was like several names or the only one that I can really remember is that there was like a county or a town that was called Anorexia. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that as well. That felt like a bit of a yeah. That was um a that was a continent or kind con- also like island country full of Amazon warrior women. Yeah, was, was, was that that was kind of like a background joke. They never sort of explained it. They just they did, did just said like yeah. did they ever say oh that's where anorexics come from sort of thing like that. It was just like no, it was just called anorexia because it's a weird. Word. It felt like it felt, it felt like entering someone's role play game that they've made, and they've put in all these jokes. But now they're not longer funny anymore. But we still use them. <laughs> so you mean like going into your game? Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, very true. That's why. That, that's why. I, that's why I, I say with a complete straight face, Castle Grayskull. Yeah. Just like, um, well, I can't think of a name for this at the moment. Will just uh, what, what sounds a bit weird. Yeah, like, actually, yeah, let's go with that. I'll think of a proper name later. Yeah, and then the joke name sticks. It felt a bit like that, which it, which is which was kind of funny in a little bit actually, like like but but only in a kind of a weird meta way. That I can imagine. I that. think that's meant to be kind of some of the humour. Yeah, it, it is. But it still kind of felt like very kind of detracting or distracting or both. Yeah. Um, so, right. Let's that's actually. One that I wanted to mention. No, that's a very good point. But uh, shall we move on to characters now? Sort of just our general thoughts on the characters. Yeah. So, what did everyone think of Jim? Was he a likable character? Was he? Did you want to beat him to death with a spoon? <laughs> Which uh, wouldn't do much. But uh, yeah, do you want to go first, Dan? Sure. Um, um, hmm? Okay. Who's going first? Who's on first? Uh, me. I'll, I'll do it. Um, I. It was kind of like a annoying character, I think. Um, 
it felt like a lot of the punchlines and like a lot of the jokes that were surrounding Jim were basically just Jim saying, "Oh shit, oh bollocks, not again, ah oh, fuck," um, which did kind of make him feel like a—I don't want to say a shallow character, but I guess kind of just kind of one one-dimensional. It was just one note. One note. That's. That's what I want to say. He was very kind of one note. It was always just, ah, oh, not again. And for a, lot of, for a lot of the story, that was kind of like the, his contribution to the comedy. Yeah. Um, it's like Yahtzee could get away with having a stupid world if his main character was going, mmm, rolling his eyes all the time. So, yeah, it's going, this is stupid sort of thing. And then still having those elements in the story. So. And he does kind of like have this, the glorious quest to die and... It was kind of annoying that he would always kind of like have the chance to be kind of obliterated, but whenever it came up, it would he never would. And then there's the whole kind of um, reluctant hero type element to him, where he keeps denying that he's a hero and that he doesn't want to be a hero, but he you does. You kind of think that's going somewhere, but it's not really, is it? Spider no. no. Which is but, then again, that could be Yahtzee very much going, I'm not going to do a proper story arc, I'm not going to do a generic you know, hero to realise he is a hero story. Well, there's lots of other places you could take that arc. Yeah. And you still need character growth. And you're supposed to like, have it um, in like in that part where he says, like, no, I'm not going to be a hero, I'm going to be a protagonist. Um, yeah, that's that's so the that's very end of the book. Yeah, that's his growth is just like at the very end. It takes the entire book for anything to change. We don't have like the death and rebirth of the hero. We don't have the. Um... <clears throat> well, that's interesting actually, because you could say the book is parodying uh, fantasy novels and books and narratives in general. Yeah, I, I just realised I said, but you don't have the death and rebirth of the story. Uh, but they're not the same thing. They're they're completely different thing. He isn't meant to be the main character. So you're parodying two different things simultaneously. Which is a bit odd as well. Very fair point. Yeah. Whereas, it, whereas if he had become the character, you could have done the classic. Maybe that's a bit too obvious. But the idea that he is a nobody and then he becomes the main character—that's been overdone. But <laughs> that's basically Wreck It Ralph. But uh, well, a way you could take it is, he's a nobody, and he thinks he's going to go become a somebody. Or sort of, we allude to him becoming a somebody in the plot. Yeah. That's sort of meant to be his arc. But he just stays a some a nobody. What, so his drive should have been to, to, to accomplish something, but he never can. Yeah. Hmm, Whereas he can consistently achieve his goal throughout the book and chooses not to for no reason, and it's lampshaded, which is annoying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So was Jim, was Jim meant to be special in the book? He wasn't especially, was he? But he was just... Uh, he, he's all... he special. His circumstance was special because he was resurrected by Dreadgrave. Yeah, but he wasn't the only one, was he? Mm. No, but it was just because he kind of had all of the shit happen to him. So, like, he fell through the world. He had the deleter's eyes put into him. He yeah. uh, kept dying more often than everyone else. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. That's very he died a lot more than Meryl and um, Thaddeus and... Yeah. 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 I mean, it wasn't like specifically... Just as a note on the writing, Laurie, because yeah. you're, you're the main writer here. Is it just does it feel like Jim is the character every writer writes when they're in their teens? Yes, uh, yes. I, I, I was almost going to get onto that as well. I was thinking, I've seen this character a lot before. There's nothing wrong with having a misanthrope cynic, but I've seen it quite a lot before. Yeah, yeah it's that same sarcastic, but is for some reason loved character that every... Yeah. Do you want to write in the I don't really care kind of character? The the the, the Swin type character, the yeah. other character I can think of. Yeah. Actually, and um, actually, sort of to compare him to Win Winswind because that's basically the biggest comparison you can make in terms of direct characters. Yeah. The I think the reason Winswind works so much better is because Winswind is fundamentally likable, and bad things happening to a likable person. Is yeah. something that you can watch. Whereas Jim is not as likable a character. He's witty, but he's not. We're never given any reason to like him, really. Yeah. 
It's only his um, monologue. It's only the fact that he is the Yahtzee avatar, as it were. That's, yeah. That we yeah he's only enjoyable to read because Yahtzee is a good, has a great wit. But when bad things happen to him, if he'd been a more likable character, I think that could have carried the plot more. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. And he's a character that I've kind of seen before, and it wasn't anything special. Hmm. But then I wanted him to be something a bit more... It is difficult to say what I would have fit him as in this role, really. Because it felt like a role that needed to be written by Yahtzee, but I don't know, maybe a bit... Uh, it would have made a more entertaining protagonist. Meryl. What do you think, Meryl? <laughs> what about the other characters? Well, you know, let's do Slippery John next, because he's the next big character. Yeah. Because Thaddeus and Meryl are kind of non-characters, but... Yeah. Um, so, Dan, do you want to start on Slippery John? Um, Slippery John is just a French prick. Um, he's basically introduced as, like, an idiot adventurer who kind of... Is very cool of himself. Kind of keeps cool. He he keeps referring to himself in the third person. Um, says that he's great at everything. Often kind of displays himself as not being so. Having been put into the rat pit six times, I think, by Jim. Um, and he kind of keeps popping up everywhere, doing kind of ridiculous stuff. Ridiculous stuff with his wife and or girlfriend. Um, but he is part of the magic resistance and at the end and he does kind of like I think it's before he's turned into the rabbit or just kind of just after towards the end later part of the later part of the book um, he kind of like has that line where he goes it's like sometimes you know you don't need to be the hero there's nothing wrong with being the protagonist yeah, uh, something along those lines and that's kind of the point where it's kind of suggested that maybe he's not as big a fool as he presents himself as. And I think, like, even Jim is about to kind of question him as if that's kind of something which is far too intelligent to have come from Slippery John. Uh, but then someone tries to attack him, or someone tries to kidnap him or something, and he doesn't get a chance to. And doesn't really go anywhere with it. Don't really go anywhere with it until later on the... the at Mount Murdercruel, which, because I think Slippery John does like say that he doesn't know where the Nexus is. It's something which um, the vampire would have known. But he does have his magic crampons so that they can kind of climb, climb to the top of Mount Murdercruel. Um, and that's kind of like supposed to be his big reveal that he's not a bumbling idiot, he's just playing the fool to avoid the syndrome. Because the syndrome only attacks the handsome, excellent adventurers. So he, with his ridiculous moustache and constant bumbling, is kind of safe from the syndrome, or more safe than anyone else, because no one kind of wants to play that kind of French twat. Um, Does it it sort of imply that when you make a character in the world, that that character always existed in the world, then, or do they say they come into into being? Uh, Yes, so you basically don't create your character, you take control of somebody that's already in the world. That's kind of like what the syndrome was. Yeah, which is lacked normal. Work, is it? Say again? That isn't how the thing work, is it? It's not how MMOs work, but that was how Mog World was going to kind of sell itself. Okay. That was like, that was Mog World's unique selling point. Fair enough. Um... And there's kind of like the hints that he has the magic crampons, which is unusual to have in himself, but he's also got two pairs uh, rather than just one for himself, or three for all of them, because it's Thaddeus, Jim, and yeah, himself. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that the bit that made me feel, that just felt like, I didn't know, it didn't really feel like a character mm -hmm. or a It didn't feel like they were trying to, he was trying to write himself out of that situation or something, trying to write, just like, change the situation, but he literally only put himself in the situation, and it doesn't really go anywhere, so didn't really feel validated. There's no way he could have anticipated that situation. No, he should have just been, he should have done something heroic. He should have done something like, you know, unexpectedly like skilled or cool, opposed to just he happens to have the right boots and therefore he is a great hero, really. 
But yeah, I mean, I it think... also kind of shows that you know he has been like there at every step of the way, and he has kind of essentially directed Jim's journey. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he kind of um, basically informed Jim about well, everything that was going on in the world, pointed in the direction of uh, magic resistance, was there with the pirates so that he could get passage from one place to the other, which didn't kind of pan out, but that you could argue that was the idea. Um, he was there to draw like attention from the guards away from Jim. He was there to kind of bust him out of the prison. Kind of every step of the way, he was there and kind of nudging them in the right direction or helping them out in some way. Or yeah, and also. <laughs> And also, kind of like the whole rabbit polymorph thing. Um, if he was such a great adventurer, why did he want to stay on his rabbit then? So, yeah. If he was such a great adventurer, why did he want to stay as rabbit? Was it literally just because of the boobs thing? To avoid uh, detection from the guards. Yeah. Uh, possibly, like, a few other reasons, but. Um, that did kind of feel like this is a joke moment. Yeah. Could have been. But, um... And also, there's, like, that, world building and, like, past and, like, uh, this is magic, this is how magic works. And also, I think it was... A, part of it was to kind of throw in that joke about the rabbits being immortal, because otherwise you've got, like, this very low-level spell where you can turn someone into a rabbit and then just stamp on yeah. them. Yeah. So... But, um, is it just me, or does Slippery John feel like a character who Yahtzee went, okay, and there's going to be this syndrome where people are taken over, good, you know, amazing adventurers are taken over. What if there was a guy avoiding the syndrome by being an idiot? Yeah, but that would have been fine, but I think they should have established that a bit earlier on or something. But no, that's, I think that's as far as he went with Slippery John's character. Yeah, well, he was kind of a, he was kind of a comic relief, wasn't he? He was the... the, the you would say and do silly things and that would... Yeah, which is kind of meant to be the traditional role of the rogue in the comic adventure. Yeah. But, yeah, he... For being such a big character, there's not much to him. Yeah. Like, uh, Meryl and Thaddeus. I do call non characters. Yeah. They're, they're, they're kind of walking punch lines. They kind of follow him around. So we can have some banter off. And, yeah. And, you know, and pretty much in the story. And Slippery John was just like a different way that Jim could bounce off people. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. But um, going back to the point I was making before about Meryl, I think she would have been a more interesting character to follow with the original plot of sort of the undead minions working for an overlord. Oh, Dan, can you turn your volume off slightly? Oh, yeah. Because she's so enthusiastic and sort of so engaged with it all and sort of so upbeat and very unminion like it would have been a better character to follow than Jim. But also for, like, the, the last three quarters of the book, she's lying about all that kind of... Well, she's not really there. Well, yeah, but also kind of like the mo because when like Jim like at the start before they get to the pirate town or the glitching town, she journeys off to try to inspire rebellion and trigger a revolt in uh, Beauregard to throw off their oppressors. Um, but that kind of all goes to shit. No one really wants to throw off their oppressors because they're just pig farmers and whoever they have in control of them, they're always just going to be pig farmers. Um, And after that, she kind of finds Jim again and she kind of reveals at the end that she was just going to kind of help him on his quest to die so that she could do the same. Yeah. Is that really lying? I mean, it was pretty clear that she hadn't completed her quest. 
Yeah. It was clear that she hadn't completed her quest, but it wasn't clear that she was just following Jim so that she could kill herself as well. Yeah, the last bit, yeah. Because I think it's kind of implied that she's meant to be a love interest, but at the end she's just like, hell no. Yeah, there's also characters that are implied to do something or have a role that doesn't really go anywhere. But mm. she was like the mo- she was the love interest who wasn't the love interest. It was like we're supposed to have a love interest, so let's do it a bit different. Yeah, yeah it was trying to do everything different. Just trying to trying to put in the cliches and then go a different way with them, but then kind of just not go anywhere with it and have the cliches in and then just mm. sit there and not develop. So, what do you guys think it would take to improve the novel to the point where it could be considered a I don't want to say a good novel, but sort of could be considered a good in, a good parody novel. Um, yeah, like a stronger, more motivated main character, possibly. I don't mind the idea that he's trying to die. I don't, because I think having an anti hero is kind of the theme of the story, isn't it? Really, someone who's not interested, you can't change that without knowing what it's about. But maybe playing up his role as a like an Indian sort of thing more than that. Maybe, maybe, maybe in the majority of the game, maybe it's a bit more. You can use Terry Pratchett, maybe a bit more like Monster's Brain, like one of many exploring different situations, traveling around people, slowly unraveling what's going on. Uh, and a variety of different situations, I think. And, uh, yeah. No, I, I agree with most of that. No? I would say just make it less kind of silly. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of silly in it. It seems odd to say. But yeah. It's very silly, but I think if it was... Because you can like make it like a serious kind of novel, because it's, it's kind of a silly concept and a silly idea and it's parody, but if you just kind of played it serious, um, give Jim more reactions than just kind of, oh, bugger, oh, shit, um, or, oh... But Barry. Um, well, like for example, at the beginning, you could have had him find find out about the gods a bit earlier on, and then his goal is to speak to the gods, and that's what he wants to do to ask him why, why is he here, what is his purpose, mm-hmm. like that. That way, like you know, if it's just I want to die, it's like I can do something, I'll discover something, and then and that then maybe the bug end he doesn't realise he didn't want to, but he changes his ambitions or something like that. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I don't know, I just Say again? Well, have we said all we want on this? Is that this? Um, no, I was just going to say that. I think. So, yeah, I, I, I would say like a good first book, interesting, funny in parts, but laugh out loud funny, not strong in the story. Would you recommend it? Would people recommend it to anyone else to read? If they were younger and hadn't didn't know about it, then yeah, it's. If they've never read any of the books, any of the comedy fantasy books, it would be hilarious. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. recommend it. Mm. Well, you said the same thing. When, when I first discovered it, he basically said to me, yes, yeah, so he's written two books, skip more for a while, read Jam, pretty much. Mm. Yeah, I'd rather... I'd just say go straight to Terry Pratchett. Yeah. I yes, but I wouldn't try and put someone off if they wanted to read it. Yeah. I mean, I mean if they put in a lot more and more political jokes, maybe make them like... Uh, a monster who wants to become an adventurer and he's tr- trying to live through those steps of an adventurer, then you have something that people who play more could identify with, could identify with the effect of Oh, isn't it annoying when that happens? Isn't it annoying when that happens? Isn't that funny when that happens? Isn't it weird? And then basically all the adventurers are going around just doing it as a matter of course. And he's just like, you really stupid to go do anything. And yeah, you could actually do something very intelligent with that. Yeah. Like have a cobalt like analyzing the way adventurers behave. It's like no, you can do this much simpler. Yeah, you can, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I might write that now. Yeah, you know, like 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 I've I played some multiplayer adventure games, and they're like, oh, you must, you are the chosen one. You must go here and like, uh, okay, and and fight this thing. And you go there, and there's already a group of people there doing it already, and then you just join them, and then you run back, and you can almost, you can almost see the queue of people going up to the wise man or whatever. You are the chosen one. You must do this. You are the chosen one. You must do this. And it's just, we can't all be the sacred personal chosen one. <laughs> like that, I, the stuff that he parodies in the bloody zero punctuation would have been great. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, let's wrap it up tonight. Yeah. Um, next month, or whenever we're doing this next, we are going to be reading. Hold on, the Bone Collector, by Jeffrey Daver. 
Uh, this was made into a film of the same name in 1999 with um, Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. Sorry, Angelina Jolie. I know. <laughs> it was a pretty good film, so serial killer book. So can I just watch the film instead of read the book? No. 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 You must do both. <laughs> you have to do both. <laughs> I've not read the book either, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it uh, parallels. Hmm. So um, thank you all for watching. Uh, this has been the Generic Book Club. We hope you found us enjoyable but not nutritional, or whatever our usual sign out is. <laughs> Bye. Good. Yeah, Good night. thank you for listening. We'll see you again next month. Bye. Farewell. Bye.